Hi, my name is Alison Flett. I'm an associate in the employment team here at Clark's Legal. This is the sixth in our GP in 10 podcast series, and in this session I'll be looking at what transfers under GP. By way of a reminder, when I use the term transferee, I'm referring to the incoming business owner or provider, and likewise, when using the term transferor, I'm referring to the old business owner or provider. The automatic transfer principle is set out in Regulation 4.1 of TUPI. When TUPI applies, the contract of employment of all employees employed by the transferor and assigned to the undertaking, or in the case of a service provision change, assigned to the services, automatically transfer to the transferee. All of the transferor's rights, powers, duties and liabilities under or in connection with the transferring employee's contract of employment pass to the transferee. Also, any act or omission of the transfer or pre-transfer which relates to the transferring employee or their employment will be deemed to have been an act or omission of the transferee. Subject to a few exceptions, the transferee effectively steps into the shoes of the transferor as the employer of the transferring employees. So, what rights and liabilities relating to the individual's transfer under TUPI? And I've set these out in the slides here. First up is contractual rights. As we know, contractual terms can be either express, implied, incorporated or statutory. These contractual terms all transfer under TUPI. It is therefore crucial for the transferee to ask probing questions of the transferor in the context of any due diligence exercise so that they can fully identify all of the contractual terms that apply to the transferring employees. Secondly, non-contractual and discretionary rights and benefits. It is not only purely contractual terms and conditions which transfer to the transferee. Any rights and obligations connected with the contract of employment also transfer. This means that non-contractual obligations of the transferor pass to the transferee, such as obligations imposed by statute or the common law. However, the relevant non-contractual obligation must have been legally enforceable against the transferor pre-transfer for it to bind the transferee. For example, a purely non-contractual policy would not be legally enforceable against the transferor before the transfer, and so it would not be legally enforceable against the transferee after the transfer. Next up then is continuity of employment. A cheapy transfer will not break continuity of service. Therefore, if, for example, a transferring employee has 14 months service at the time of the transfer, they will only need to work for the transferor for a further 10 months before requiring ordinary unfair dismissal rights and the right to a statutory redundancy payment, for example. Acts and omissions before the transfer. It is important to remember that any acts or omissions of the transferor before the transfer are treated as having been done by the transferee. For example, the transferee will inherit the discriminatory acts of the transferor pre-transfer. What about statutory rights then? Whilst there are limited exceptions, as a general rule, statutory rights and liabilities can pass to the transferee. This will include claims relating to equal pay, discrimination, wrongful and awful wrongful and unfair dismissal, sorry, redundancy, working time and rights for part-time and fixed-term workers. So, tortious and civil liabilities. As a general rule, tortious and civil liability will also pass to the transferee. This will include personal injury claim. And finally, pension rights and, and liabilities. These are covered later on in the session. So, let's move on to look at trade union recognition, collective rights and liabilities. Firstly, trade union recognition. If an independent trade union is recognised by the transferor in respect of any of the transferring employees, this recognition will transfer to the transferee provided that the transferring group maintains an identity distinct from the rest of the transferee's business. Now, it is unclear exactly what is required for the transferred group to maintain an identity distinct from the rest of the transferee's business. However, If the transferring group is fully integrated into the transferee's existing business after the transfer, it is highly unlikely that union recognition will transfer. As you may be aware, there are two types of trade union recognition, voluntary recognition and statutory recognition. Somewhat unhelpfully, TUPI makes no distinction between these two types of recognition, and although it's been suggested by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy that only voluntary recognition passes to the transferee on a TUPI transfer, it is safer to assume that both could transfer. Moving on to collective agreements then. A collective agreement which has been made by the transferor or on its behalf, with a trade union recognised by it in relation to some or all of the transferring employees, will transfer to the transferee. And anything done by the transferor in connection with that agreement is deemed to have been done by the transferee. The terms which are enforced under a collective agreement at the date of the transfer are those which transfer. If any new terms are 
are agreed post-transfer between the transferor and the trade union in accordance with the collective agreement, they will not have any effect on employees who have already transferred. And finally, the duty to inform and consult. As some of you may be aware, where the transferor has failed in its duties to inform and consult under Chupi, liability will be joint and several, and so the transferee will be jointly and severally liable with the transferor. So, we've looked at what rights and liabilities transfer under Chupi. This therefore leaves the question of which ones remain with the transferor after the transfer. And I've set these out in the slide. I don't intend to go through these for the purposes of the podcast, but hopefully these are self-explanatory. Moving on then to the more complex Chupi and pension rights, the automatic transfer principle does not apply to old age, invalidity and survivor's benefits under occupational pension scheme. This means that any contractual terms, rights, liabilities and obligations which relate to old age, invalidity and survivor's benefits under an occupational pension scheme do not transfer to the transferee. The pensions exemption applies to the following rights. Pensions are payable on or after the normal retirement age, i.e. old age benefits, ill health early retirement benefits, i.e. invalidity benefits, and benefits payable to members dependent on the death of the member before or after normal pension age, i.e. survivor's benefits. Firstly, the exception only applies to occupational pension schemes. It does not therefore apply to any other pension arrangement and therefore that other arrangement does transfer to the transferee under Chupi. Secondly, the pensions exemption only applies to old age, invalidity and survivor's benefits under an occupational pension scheme. This exemption does not therefore cover the following benefits and so the obligation to provide them transfers to the transferee. And I've set these out on this slide. You've got early no- early retirement benefits other than ill for health, including the right to early retirement voluntarily, enhanced redundancy benefits related to an occupational pension scheme, specific future pension under the Pension Act, other benefits provided in an occupational pension scheme which are not old age, invalidity or survivor's benefits, for example, critical health insurance. And what a phrase that you might have heard um, bandied about quite commonly is Beckman and Bar- Martin rights. In two cases in the European Court of Justice, known as the Beckman and Martin cases, it was decided that the occupational pension scheme TUPI exemption did not extend to those those pension benefits payable on early retirement, such as enhanced redundancy benefits. As a consequence of these decisions, early retirement rights, such as an enhanced enhanced pension on redundancy, could transfer from the seller to the buyer on a business acquisition even if the current employer is operating a defined contribution arrangement, the rights could still exist. This means that the buyer could face claims in relation to early retirement benefits if those pension benefits are not replicated by the buyer. If any of the employees could have such rights as a result of joining the employer through a historic cheapy transfer, we recommend that the employer seeks legal advice before making redundancies. And finally, just to look at the obligation on the transferee to provide an alternative pension scheme. To complement the pensions exemption in TUPI, the transferee is obliged in certain situations to provide a minimum level of alternative pension provision. If any of the transferring employees immediately before the transfer was a member or was eligible to be a member of an occupational pension scheme provided by the transferor, the transferee must provide an alternative defined contribution scheme with matching contributions of up to 6% of the employee's basic pay. The obligation applies even if the transferor's scheme was a defined benefit scheme. If the transferor's scheme was a defined contribution scheme, there is an additional requirement that the transferor must always have also have made or have been required to make contributions in addition to the employee's contributions for the obligation on the transferee to provide a replacement scheme to come into force. Well, that brings us to the end of the podcast and I hope you found it helpful. The next podcast in the series will be looking at changing terms and conditions following a GP transfer, so make sure you keep an eye out for that one.